Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the latest Knowledge Network on Climate Assembly learning call, this time on Denmark's Climate Assembly. It's a really um, significant time at the moment for um, climate assemblies, particularly at the national level. As we're going to hear very shortly, the Danes have recently, the, the Danish Climate Assembly has uh, made its recommendations in the last few days. Within the last month, Scotland's Climate Assembly reconvened to provide its response to the government's response to its recommendations in quite forthright terms. We're seeing uh, assemblies uh, progress in Austria, in Luxembourg and in Spain. And of course, there's a whole bunch of local and regional assemblies. And in fact, uh, Kanoka has recently created a map where we're trying to uh, we're trying to keep a record of all the assemblies that are happening. So if any of you know of any assemblies, that are, please have a look at the website. If any of you know of any assemblies that, uh, that, we, should be, uh, that we should be including, please let us know. Um, I should have told you from the start, we're recording this call um, and it will be uploaded to the uh, Kanoka website. So uh, please, if you don't want to be seen at any point, then, uh, uh, well, we're only um, showing people who are speaking um, but uh, yeah, if you if you don't want to be shown and you want to speak, then um, please keep your camera off. Um, I, don't, I don't think that made sense, but I, I know what I meant. <laughs> uh, we're also uh, in the middle of four knowledge development projects, which um, are giving members of the uh, members of the community a chance to participate in knowledge development on other aspects, critical aspects of climate assembly practice. So. Again, please, uh, details of that are on our website. It's an opportunity for you to be engaged. Anyway, today we'll be talking, as I said, about uh, the Denmark's Climate Assembly, and I'm gonna be joined uh, by three members of that assembly, uh, three people who are involved, sorry, not members, but three people who've been involved in that assembly. Um, and uh, we are gonna have plenty of time um, for members, uh, for participants on the call, to actually ask questions. It's something we've been, uh, some feedback we've had is people haven't felt that there's been enough time towards the end to, to ask questions. So we've, we've made sure that's the case. Uh, the three people who'll be joining me on this call will be uh, Lars Kluhr, who's the director of the Danish Board of Technology and lead facilitator of the assembly. Uh, Britta Gernay, the, who, is a part, who is a participant in the assembly and Ingrid Brandt, who's a doctoral researcher at the University of Copenhagen, who's been following the process. Um, the Danish Assembly is interested, interesting for at least three reasons, and I think we'll find out there will be more reasons as we, as we carry on. The first is it was clearly linked to the annual climate policy making process within Denmark. So there was a clear link between the Assembly and a particular governmental uh, policy process. Secondly, unlike other assemblies, it had two phases. It wasn't just a single one off. There were two different phases um, and we'll be exploring the uh, rationale for that. And thirdly, uh, compared to other sit assemblies, citizens were given much more space to decide which themes they wanted to engage on. And again, that's something we'll be looking at. I think there's a fourth interesting issue here, which uh, we, may, we may come to, which is actually it had a very low budget and uh, the Danish Board of Technology were so keen on uh, seeing this uh, assembly happen that they, I think it's fair to say, cross-subsidised the activity. So I'm going to start um, by talking to Lars and then I'll bring Britta and then Ingrid in. So um, if we can bring Lars into the space, that'd be great. So first of all, Lars, congratulations on delivering, delivering the assembly. Uh, many of us in this, um, in this call know how hard that is. And uh, so, uh, so congratulations on that. Um, could you start off by telling us a little bit about what the task of the assembly was and how it actually linked to the Danish policy context? Because I think that's really critical. Yes, I mean, the Danish policy context is influenced by the phase Denmark is in in the, uh, in the uh, climate uh, mitigation and adaptation process. Um, you could say that we are, we are being concrete in Danish policy. It's not visions. It's not uh, where should we go. It's also that, uh, but but it's it's very concrete. And the government has to make concrete action plans for each year, which is evaluated by a climate council. And uh, after they evaluate, the government has to revisit this uh, these plans, and uh, then they go into the parliament for discussions and negotiations, and it has to be accepted. So the government is is making a, there's a there's a yearly round of processes each year. Yeah, 
a yearly round each year. That makes sense. <laughs> yes. And um, and the, the climate assembly actually was decided to happen in the negotiation about establishing the law that made this yearly process. Uh, establish that yearly process. So, so it was decided by the parties, the, the, the a majority in parliament that simply took the decision that such a law that forced the government to make such a process should be installed and it has been installed. So it's not in the law, it's in this pre-work for the law that there should be a citizen assembly. And the task is described as pro uh, providing the citizens input to the policy process connected to the climate law, simply. Okay. And and then you then all the then all the uh, you could say uh, uh, yeah or uh, then you can begin to analyze what does that mean. Okay. So so the the interesting thing I I think one one of the really interesting things about the Danish one it, a it was li linked to this policy process but b you decided to do it in two phases and so actually it's linked I think to two different annual processes so the first the first sec the first session ran in October 2020 to March 2021, and the more recent one in October uh, 2021 to December uh, to December this year. So yeah. um, what was the rationale for having a two-phase a, a two process? I, I, I think it simply was this uh, yearly uh, cycle, so that, that there could be an output rather early uh, for the cycle that was negotiated uh, when and then when this was decided uh, and and then there could be one that that had more of the next cycle as its its target okay so it's simply in order to to in some way try to fit it but it was not it was not very well fit and uh, and then corona came in and then every, all plans crashed oh, yeah but but uh, i mean but but i think the whole the whole uh, meaning behind it was that it should fit to the cycle and and so the, the the idea was to kind of like have one part in, in in one cycle, another another part in another cycle. Okay, and so it's not just that you were trying to affect two cycles, but you actually, as far as I understand it, you also you also designed it slightly differently in, in each cycle. So we can think of an assembly being a quite a you know not not standard, but you know you're you're, you're running an assembly which has a number of uh, weekends and evening sessions that that you ran. But actually, what the citizens were asked to do was slightly different in the two cycles, as I understand it, Lars. Uh, they were, and and we actually the first weekend and the first uh, cycle was uh, was the um, had had uh, expert presentations uh, designed by uh, an expert board, and uh, and it ended up, and then they had had the brainstorms in the, in the citizen assembly about what is it we want to to. Uh, to decide on and give advice about. So it's very brainstormy brainstorm, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and we ended that um, that first weekend with a little survey, simply in order to, to already feed in some ideas to the politicians about where this climate assembly was, with regards to some of the very topical discussions. Uh, so it was just to give a little taste of, of, of that for example and, and one of the one of the things that everybody noticed at that time was that that the citizen assembly had a very large majority supporting uh, climate tax so and then we began to work we began to have evening everything went online so the weekends and everything were online and and then we had evening meetings uh, and we had uh, and all of these meetings were thematic and we had a uh, and we had a short, an hour presentation, and then we had two hours to work with content. Uh, so the citizens were sitting in their editorial groups uh, working with, with the text. Uh, so it was slowly built up through during these meetings. So what, what, just, just to clarify, in this, in this first phase, mm. um, you, you, you gave the citizens some space to decide which of the theme, which issues with it that they with it within it within a remit that, that, that yes. they would like to focus. Yeah, on. yeah, I, I lost the thread. I'm, I'm just uh, they they brainstormed over the first weekend. We then clustered that into th themes. Uh, these themes ended up being r rather uh, traditional, as uh, at least the main themes. We had sub themes that were specified to what came in, and they were they 
they jumped a bit out of the, norm, the normal way of framing these problems. Okay. Uh, and, and then when we had a discussion, the first uh, evening meeting about these themes, then this, some from the citizen assembly suggested that there were added a new theme, which was about public and uh, education and enlightenment, citizen engagement. So we took a, a vote on that and it was decided by the uh, citizen assembly and then we worked on with that theme as well. So, so Lars, that, that's a, a really interesting development because most assemblies, it's usually the um, it's usually a specialist group or the or, or expert leads who decide what areas the citizens are going to be focusing on, and then obviously they develop their recommendations within that. Why did you decide that actually it was important that the the citizens should have a, a more more be more empowered in that process? Uh, yes, I'm just to say we did it, we even made it more empowered in the second round. Because there we had the whole first weekend about uh, developing themes uh, bottom up. You, you, uh, so, you've, 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 you've gone. You've, you've seen my scheme. I was actually going to go to saying it's even more empowered in the second. But okay, <laughs> okay. It's nice to be ahead of you for once. So, um, but okay. But this, is, but this is really interesting, Lars, because um, you, you kind of created that. So it, it, was there a particular philosophy behind that? A particular rationale? Yeah, from our perspective as facilitators, yes, to, to be experimental and see how these things worked. But also to listen to the evaluation from the citizen assembly when, where there was some discussions about that maybe we had been a little too uh, traditional uh, in our way of, uh, of clustering and defining the themes. And maybe it would be nice to not be so guided on that and just see what comes from the citizen assembly themselves. So we simply said, yeah, why not? That's a good idea. Let's try to go fully uh, bottom up. Oh, but oh, we oh, might oh. come to that. It had its price, in my view. Sorry? It had, it its, had price. its price. Okay, okay. So, so let's follow up on that before I go into my answers. So what do you feel the price was? So, so I think my, my, I, I think the, the good thing you get is this is, uh, has an authenticity, which is, uh, of course, I think important. Uh, uh, but we used the whole weekend on developing these themes and that pressed the production of the text and the, uh, and, and the recommendations later. And I think if you look at the text in the, second, uh, in the second phase compared to the first phase, it's not as worked out, it's not as detailed. Uh, and and, uh, and it, uh, I think if we um, a mix, um, uh, some kind of middle road would be a middle of the road would have been nice to find. And okay. that's what I would do in a, in a third. And one, one thing we didn't one thing we didn't clarify was that it wasn't completely the same citizens moving from one phase to the second phase. Actually, some of the some of the participants were the same, but actually the majority of them were were new. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. OK, did you so? So you just said that you'd, you'd like to go for a middle way. Can you could if, if you were asked to do this again, how do you how, how would you do that? So there's a, this very big discussion about if framing should be top down or bottom up. And in my view, I think it should be all of it uh, now. I think that's what I have learned that if, if for example, the, polit polit the, the, the committee in the parliament says, so oh, we have something we discussed now, it's very important and, and we will have to conclude on it in, inside the next half year. Could you please tell us uh, what, we, what you think we should do? then why not and and my feeling is that but i would like to hear uh, 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 what she wants to say about that but my feeling is would be welcomed by the uh, by by the assembly because some of the questions that came up all along was what would we really would use our our outcome for I mean, is there really a, an ask for it and so on? So if, so if the politicians came with a clear ask, then I think it would be welcomed by, by an assembly. But on, on the other hand, it should not be on the cost of the citizens being able to define something they find important. So I think a mix, uh, maybe stating something, this is, we're going to work with this, and then have some process uh, brainstormed, clustering, and and um, and and begin to um, more bottom up uh, add to that. So, for, so for you, it's it's not an either or. It's actually trying to trying trying to trying to get the best of both worlds. Yes. Okay. You you mentioned I know I know one of the things you're quite um, proud of or quite pleased with is the way that the actual you you shape the recommendations at the end. What what's come out at the end of this. And you've, you've, you've got quite strong feelings, I know, about sort of 
making sure that recommendations resonate. So could you tell us a bit about a bit, a bit about how you how you facilitated the recommendation process and the, and the way that that was structured? Yes, we, uh, we, we, we did a lot out of trying to explain that, uh, I mean, we, as the Danish Board of Technology has 30 years of experience of being an advisor to policy. And we would never just give uh, a five line recommendation and then hope that people would, uh, that policymakers would follow that. If they would look at it as a parole or something like that, as a kind of just a statement. And it just, it goes in the one ear and out the other ear. It just doesn't, uh, just include to them. So, so we simply tried to, uh, uh, tried, and I would say succeeded in imposing uh, a way of giving recommendations, which is that you explain the observations you have. Why is it that you actually take this up at all? I mean, what is this, which, which problem is it that you see, and what is, and then describe what is the assessment that you have of the situation. Uh, this, these observations, how, what, which principles should be used to do to work with them? What should we have in mind? Uh, how do we make a comprehensive? Uh, how do we deal with this comprehensively and in its complexity? Explain that, and then from that you go down and you make a two to four or whatever recommendations that that connects to these explanations you have in the in the in, in the introduction text. So and so I that, think that's kind of kind of I don't know um, situating or the mo the motivation behind the uh, behind why why there are recommendations coming in this from this particular perspective or something like that yes simply uh, I mean it's it's about uh, that in, in my view that good good advice is giving in a way so that those you talk to have a chance of understanding what you're saying yeah uh, in practical life it looks like this <laughs> 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 there's a sub theme text here there are some observation assessments here, and then we begin to have the recommendations down here with the, and these are the, uh, the, the votes on them. Okay. 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 So, so, so clearly, clearly explaining what, where, I mean, that, that also helps in terms of the danger that politicians try and interpret why, why the assembly is saying what it's saying. You're actually trying to stop that from happening in some ways as well. Yeah, at least uh, lower the risk that they will totally manipulate what they hear and 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 define it and read it as they want. So you actually explain why is it that this uh, recommendation is as it is. So, so one one other um, innovation I, I understand that you brought in um, in the process was actually I know other assemblies have done this have started to do this as well, but actually to have a process of review um, by by a couple of specialists to help the to help the citizens uh, in in terms of drafting their recommendations can you say a little bit about that yes in the first round when there were drafts for the recommendations we had two uh, anonymous experts uh, one from uh, consultancy work on citizen on, on climate mitigation and adaptation and one from uh, you could say more research uh, modeling uh, and and this kind and then we had me uh, commenting on on the drafts for recommendations and it was more about oh well you say this here and there you say the other thing and as i read it these two do not really uh, go together so is are these contradictory or is the bus just language so it was it was about language and and potential misunderstandings it was also about consequence if you say this then it will have a consequence on another thing you say in another place uh, so there will be some some i mean uh, things might not fit if you're saying that and you're saying that uh, in, in in a in a in a for example in an energy system or something like that okay I so it was it was kind of a, a reactions, but not really, not advice to text. It was not uh, suggestions for text or something. I more advice on how, how do you make this a comprehensive uh, uh, product. And, and, and sort so of show, look, looking at consistency and, the, and those, yeah. those sorts of things. Yeah. I, I will, I'll ask Britta about this in a minute, but how was that, how was that received? Uh, my feeling was that it was received with the, with healthy skepticism. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, and I, I think that's good 
but on the, but but it but I mean the sentences were set and they were considered and sometimes they were they, it had consequences for the text. Other times the citizens just just did like this. I mean, uh, and uh, and 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 just stuck to what they had done. I mean, that was their decision. Okay. But at least they they knew what they potentially were up against. Okay. Um, I'd like to, at this point, I'd just like to remind people that I may not be asking the questions that you want, so please do put them in the chat and we will pick them up later. Um, so uh, one, one of the, um, I guess, one, one of the other um, characteristics of the Danish Assembly is actually you, you didn't, you, compared to other assemblies, you didn't have the best retention rate. You actually lost uh, a few citizens between, during, during, the, during the process. Um, do you have any views on what on why why that was the case? I mean, other assemblies have, have really ma have managed to keep everybody in. Do you think there's something specific about the Danish context or or the or the conditions you were working under that meant that you actually lost? I, I think you know. Well, than... we have heard, um, and I'm do not think I can cite then that other assemblies have have comparable problems. That there's actually a big uh, uh, dropout rate. But then they 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 supplement along the way. We only did that to a certain extent because it has some consequences of supplementing of not having been uh, so 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 we simply didn't uh, supplement so much. So but I, I think basically this process is, is a very demanding process. It's economically demanding. It's organizationally demanding, and it's very demanding on the citizens. And I'm, I'm I think. That's something we should discuss professionally. Uh, that that it, it has consequences of self-selection to the panel. That is so demanding. I think, and it also has consequences with regarding uh, with regards to uh, dropout. And do you, do you, I was uh, I was wondering whether um, because you and, and you know it's, it's an it's an open it's an open story that you that you had quite a low budget. Did you do you think maybe you didn't have as much resource to actually support the participants because I know that other Assemblies have put a lot of work into kind of like, you know, kind of uh, give it, giving support to the to, to the members of the assembly, or do you do you don't not think that's the case? I don't know, but I would really, really Graham like if Noka were able to put some concrete and uh, trustworthy figures on dropout and uh, and supplement uh, during during the phase because we haven't been able to get it. Okay. And it would it would be all, in order to be able to answer that question, we need to know more about the facts. Enough. That's fair enough. Um, so, so I'm kind of interested about the um, impact of the. Uh, I, I should I should mention this point. Sorry, we were hoping to have somebody from one of the political parties here, but unfortunately they had to um, drop out. I would obviously have directed this question to them. But um, what do you feel the impact has been on the policy process in terms of that you know it's been designed to be part of this um climate planning process and i wonder whether so so you know what kind of impact has there been and do you think there's been an impact a different impact from the first and the second phase or maybe you have maybe there's not enough it's too time early to uh, it's too early to that. say about the second phase mm -hmm. but but we in in the danish government established i think it was 13 what they call climate partnerships with different branches, uh, so public sector, energy sector, uh, banking sector, whatever, uh, agriculture, and so on. And each of these ha uh, were had made some stakeholder boards internally, and they made reports to the government about how these sectors uh, and branches would like to, uh, I mean, solve their part of the of of, of the transition. And these reports are being fed into the policy process as it is relevant over time. And the, the Danish reports from the citizen assembly go into the same system. So they are in a way seen as a number 14 uh, climate partnership. So when so so all the recommendations have been given to the ministries, the responsible ministries. They had to consider them in terms of what are they, which kind of policies are maybe making up for our transition. And it has in some way been written into some planning papers in these, these ministries as the other climate partnerships have. What that means, and if we are ever a, being, if we ever are, will be able to evaluate what that means for the concrete policy is a big, big question mark. 
and it's but it's the same for the climate partnerships they if something happens they don't know if because they recommended or they wanted that to happen or they wanted this uh, tax to be changed a little in this direction you don't know why this happens so that's policy i mean uh, you you feed things in and go into different systems and then nobody knows uh, what the actual uh, traces are and that that is a problem with regards to both the climate partnerships and the citizen assemblies i and think do you, do you have is there is there a formal way of uh, and part of the response it's not a full response but is there a formal way for government to respond to the assembly to say what not, it's done with it or, or not, not really but one of the parliamentarians uh, put a question to the minister uh, in the in the committee about the first assembly and to and, and asked for a report on what had happened to these uh, recommendations and they gave um, I don't know 20 pages report or something like that uh, on the single recommendations uh, how they fit into to the policy how they fit into the problems they they knew that they had to face so but no promises about uh, if if they would be decided or not okay. but also also uh, one has to know Danish policy it's always a coalition uh, decision to make any policy in Denmark. There's, there's no, it's very, very seldom that it's made uh, by a stable majority over time in, in Danish politics. Uh, majorities are made, I mean, here and there and everywhere on, on, about everything. So, so, so it's, going, it's going to be very difficult to unwrap what the influence of the assembly has been in relate because of these other, the, the other, the other partnerships as well, and, and because of the coalition, the constant coalition building. And that is a problem. And, and uh, one of the things I think could be considered in the Danish context would be to simply ask the parliament to write something in the comments to any law that any decision that it make always followed by some comments uh, from the responsible uh, uh, government and also uh, of, a, of a, com uh, a communication from the from the committee. So simply ask them, couldn't you please refer to the climate assembly if this has influenced your decision? Yeah. So that we can begin to see these the, uh, the traces of this because it is very difficult, and maybe especially in Danish policy, it's uh, making it's it's difficult. No, I think the only the only clear ones you can see are those ones where, for example, there's a promise of a referendum afterwards, or there's a, or or it's a, or it's a single you know like a single answer right when rather than a sort of series of recommendations. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's another thing if it was abortion. I mean, there's a yes and a no, and that can go to referendum. It's You, you cannot put these things to referendum, no, no, so it doesn't make sense. And so my last question before I bring, bring Britta in is, um, you know, you, you've run this over two cycles. I'm wondering whether or not there is discussion uh, about continuing this process and actually seeing it as a permanent part of the climate policy process in, in, um, in Denmark. Um, I'm I'm not quite, quite I'm not sure of uh, the form this will take, to be honest. Uh, formally, the decision uh, among the partner the parties that made this climate law was not really a time limited decision. It said that there should be established a a, a climate assembly. And then uh, this was followed up by the government of defining, you could say, a kind of a project with these two phases in. So it's a matter of how policymakers want to, uh, the government and the parliament want to, uh, you could say, follow up on this. They could, they could basically say, we have established a climate assembly. Now we're just making a, a third round or a fourth round or something. In principle, they could just do that. Uh, or they could state or, or make a law or whatever that this should be permanent or, or they could put it in, a, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the public budget as a permanent organization. Or they, there are so many ways they could go, except, of course, of not doing anything. Uh, <laughs> but there are many ways they could make, make this uh, permanent in a way as a project. They, they could just continue. They could just say, oh another and another box of money and now we run a third one and, and do you think do you have any sense of the likelihood of that or not um, ah that's very difficult <laughs> maybe ingrid will, will have some uh, I, I don't know uh, maybe brita also i i have no um, yeah i i think they were happy about this i think i think also uh i would also say to some extent uh 
proud in a way. I mean, when the citizens met with the part with with the, with the, with, the, with, with the uh, parliament last time, I think there was a very good atmosphere in the room, a very very good feeling in the room. Uh, that's this this certainly made sense. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I had a, a meeting with the committee. Um, uh, uh, what is it a month ago or something like that just kind of saying now we come with the recommendation the report is structured like this and this read it like this and this and the votes can be read like this and this just explaining it to them nothing like that and again i had this feeling that they were i, I, I were welcomed there yeah, that's great. It was, so yeah okay that's great thank, thank you on, on that note of uh, you know talk of the participants talking to the uh politicians i'd like to bring britta into the conversation if that's possible <laughs> yeah see the link, see the link there <laughs> first of all congratulations on the on the amazing work you've done i um it must have been it it sounds like it was a lot of hard work but i hope it was uh, i hope it was productive for you uh, thank you it, it it was it was a lot of hard work uh, it was a, uh, and and voluntarily you should remember that that we have all volunteered uh, in in using our time uh, and spare time in in this project um but uh, i think we were all also quite proud uh, of, so. of the results so, so i can i can nod to that when uh, <laughs> <laughs> at least I can, I, can, I can talk for myself maybe that's important for me to to say initially, Graham, that um, I'm one participant, uh, and I'm, I'm just I'm just representing uh, myself. I'm not representing uh, uh, the whole uh, assembly. Uh, it's, it's, so. re it's really important <laughs> to say that. Absolutely, yes, I think everything. that's quite important to say that. You, yeah, you have we, and and we we were a mixed bunch of uh, of people, and that's of course uh, was the fun part of it as well. Um, did you did you find that a powerful part of the process having having that kind of diversity of people? Oh, certainly that was a, that was a, a, the powerful part of it. Uh, the diversity, uh, both in terms of uh, background and age and whatsoever, uh, that was super powerful uh, and and very enriching uh, as a participant to to um, to meet up with. Um, all these different Danes that I would otherwise never have met and, and get the chance to discuss uh, uh, these important uh, issues as well. Uh, so so there, was, uh, there, there, there was a you know, good atmosphere all along, I think. Um, well, that's good. To, yeah, but well, you had fantastic facilitation, didn't you? So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, um, so what, one of the things that we were discussing with Lars there was this issue of the the the, the two phases of the assembly, and yes. in the first in the first phase you you were <clears throat> although you could choose themes you were much more directed, and in the second phase you were able to choose um, any area of, of of interest. And I should stress here that you were one of the you were one of the citizens who was in the first and the second phase, one of the few groups. So. Um, did, how, what was your um, experience of, of those two different ways of working, and it, it, did, did it affect how you worked? And and do you, is there what did you prefer one over the other? Mm. Uh, it it was certainly two very different approaches. I mean, in in approach one, in one way, uh, I found that uh, approach more qualified uh, because we we. Um, uh, I mean, it 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 allowed it it allowed all participants to get a kind of common basis uh, to to start out from. Uh, so somehow I found that in phase one we were more on um, we were more informed um, uh, to start with, um, and and uh, whether that infected our choices of topics, uh, maybe it did uh, as well. Uh, but but still, um, I, I like at least the takeaway from from my side on uh, on the first round that uh, was that we were somehow more qualified and we had a common basis uh, to to start out from. Um, uh, whereas in the second round, uh, we were kind of starting from a completely piece uh, a white piece of paper, uh, starting out from scratch. Um, I experienced that maybe there was a little bit of a tendency that some people had their own agendas. Um, uh, so there's a there's a risk um, with that approach. With that approach, I think. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with Lars that a good balance. Uh, 
uh, of this very top-down approach in, in phase one and, and uh, a very bottom-up approach in, in phase two. Uh, could, it could be beneficial to find a, find a middle way. Um, and it, it, it certainly, it, it came with a price, the second phase, uh, last is why that we did use a whole weekend uh, defining the themes. Um, um, and I also feel that our that the quality of, of our second report uh, is not as high as, as the first one. Uh, that's just my personal view. Um, we tended to use, um, um, yeah, maybe time got a little bit squeezed in the second round because we had used so much time in in defining just the the titles or the topics, uh, and and we used a lot of time in discussing the recommendation, uh, and so it was very bottom up. I mean, we used a lot of time in figuring out what do we want to recommend recommend, and then we got a little bit squeezed in uh, in uh, in finding uh, the argument and and making sure that that the argument and the explanations fitted with what we had actually recommended. <laughs> um, so I think there are pro and cons um, with, with these two approaches, certainly. Uh, I, tend, I, I, I tend to favor the first one, you may hear that, because I liked this idea that you gather these 100 uh, very different people with different backgrounds, and then you give them at least a common base um, to start out from to, to qualify the discussions a bit. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting because there's a kind of a standoff often between top down versus bottom up. Yes. And actually what, you, what you're saying is a kind of a, a, yeah, it seems to be that the experience is a bit of a, a mix would be a mix would be helpful here. I think a mix would be helpful. Yeah. Uh, and and you were actually, if I'm right as well, um, one of the one of the interesting things about the Danish assembly is that you were also able to select, have a say in who was come to give evidence to you. Is that correct? Um, I mean, to, to choose the experts. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, we were. We uh, um, of course initially, uh, technology uh, Robert Lars. Uh, they had outlined uh, a program, um, but but afterwards, um, we we uh, we could point to. Um, I don't rem I don't remember that we pointed to specific experts, but I'm sure that some participant did. Uh, but but. Um, uh, I, I, I remember that we pointed to different topics and different areas where we wanted to to uh, to have that that we wanted to have knowledge about, uh, and then the facilitator uh, uh, found some experts that could enlighten us. Um, uh, and one one of the one of the challenges within an assembly is because you'll you'll be breaking up into groups working on different yes. recommendations. Yes. One of the challenges is learning about the recommendations that others have made. How did you find that process of Mm. Did, you, did you did you feel that you're able to follow what other people in the assembly were doing, or did you feel you were working in in silos? Uh, to some extent, I mean, of course, to some extent, you you concentrate on your own uh, task uh, and and your own uh, project uh, and and uh, focus on that. Um, but but there were different uh, kind of feedback sessions where we could challenge each other and ask question and and pressure test. Um, uh, if our arguments um, uh, were solid or okay, okay, and, that, understa and, that and, and, and understandable as well, and and uh, may, may, and maybe that that part of the process worked best in the second half where we could meet physically. Uh, I mean, you should also remember that in the first round it was all online, uh, and of course that also makes a difference. Uh, whereas we actually met uh, physically um, in the second didn't... round. Just out of interest, did you did you actually enjoy meeting your fellow participants in person? Yeah, of, <laughs> of, of course I did. Uh, we, I think we all did uh, enjoy uh, meeting physically. Um, and so, and uh, how how um, pleased or disappointed are you with the way that politicians have responded to your uh, recommendations? You put all this work <laughs> in. Do you feel yes. that you, do you feel that they that they're being given the due that they deserve? Do you think they're being being taken seriously? Um, I think initially we were a little, we were disappointed because we had this online call and we were all prepared and maybe a little bit nervous um, and, and not, not so many politicians showed up uh, in, in that uh, online call. Uh, so I think that created uh, a bit of frustration and, and disappointment um, 
it was much better when we had a second chance uh, to to meet up physically um, uh, with some politicians and 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 present, and we had some uh, group discussions. Um, and uh, and and there, I think we were met with seriousness, and and they listened. Um, and and also uh, we actually asked them. Uh, we also asked them, do you have some? I mean, do you have a question for us that you want to to investigate? <laughs> uh, you, made, you made it clear that you you could you could do some more work. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, so uh, so I, I think that was a that was a good experience to to meet them physically and and um, have the discussions in. And do you get do you get the sense that do you get the sense they are taking your recommendations seriously? Uh, it's my personal uh, view. Yes, I, 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 I did get the sense, at least at that physical meeting, that uh, they were taking the recommendation seriously and and uh, try to fit them in uh, in 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 their work uh, where it made sense. Um, okay. So a last a last question for you. So there, there are a lot of people who are. Um, a skeptical, shall we say, mm. that, that everyday people like your like yourself can mm. make sound judgments mm. about complex issues like climate, yeah, and climate change. How do you how do you respond to those people who say, well, citizens can't do this kind of work? Uh, <laughs> but I, th I think we've just proven that we can. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think that we have proven that when you give ordinary citizen a task and a responsibility, then you take it up. Uh, and and can actually deliver quite solid work. Uh, so I think you should regard this that I mean these are the views from from ordinary citizens. And actually, when you look into it, our recommendations are are not far off uh, from what the experts um, are recommending. Of course, we have also listened to experts um, and listened to politicians and have have had our own discussions, a lot of discussions, and we have not agreed all the way. Um, uh, but you, uh, yeah, you just shouldn't underestimate the uh, ordinary citizens. Um, they are, we, we can we can take the responsibility when when we are asked. Okay, that's really great, Britta. Listen, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to move on to Ingrid, but I'll bring you back yes. in a, in a minute for because yes. I know there's some questions coming in the in the chat. So th thank okay, you. Okay, please do. Okay. Hi, Ingrid. Um, Hi. So as I understand it, you're one of the one of the researchers who followed the process through from the start to the finish. Yeah. Um, you probably never seen a process like this before. So I'm just initially I'm kind of interested. What what were your what were your impressions of this of this strange process? So I think it was actually quite um, special for me coming into this because um, so I'm a PhD student at the University of Copenhagen, and I actually just I got my PhD after the assembly had already been going for some months. So my research group had been following and, you know, it was really awkward for us because we we were also following on Zoom, but we had to feel like uh, we couldn't, you know, participate. So we, should, we were like in the dark cameras and uh, couldn't speak or <laughs> like had to really respect that we were not, we were only observers. So we really were only observing. So it was special for me because um, I came in when the first round was just finishing. I heard um, the citizens, especially I, I followed the weekend where they were kind of uh, finally deliberating and figuring out which recommendations they would like uh, kind of uh, end up suggesting for government. So it was for me that, that was a fantastic experience coming in that at that point in the face because I think I was there when the recommendations were like just being decided. Um, so that's, that's so, actually that's that's a real honor, actually, Ingrid, because usually those sessions are, are closed to people. Usually, people can only see the plenary session. So you've you've actually had the kind of access that most people will never have. Yeah, and it's been a real privilege, I think, because uh, it's both we were both uh, able to be a lot of researchers uh, following the first phase, and in the second phase. Uh, you know, this is how it is, then interest may like uh, decrease a little bit from the research environment. But I was a, I, I, I could be in all of the meetings and uh, I was in the whole weekend while the 
citizens or meeting up physically, I was there. So I sometimes I des describe myself as a parasite to the climate <laughs> citizens assembly because I really tried to <laughs> immerse myself in it. <laughs> and I uh, have also got the honor of talking with a lot of the citizens in, and uh, also the organizers and ministries. So I try to like really understand what this experience of participation was like for the citizens and I think research, yeah. researchers are often parasites on these kind of policy processes, and they? Yeah, definitely. We, just hope we, we, we hope we're not destructive parasites, but, you know, that, that's interesting. So um, so you, you've obviously been focused on the Danish one, but you've also got some awareness of, 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 other, of other assemblies. And I just wonder how you feel that the Danish assembly compares to, to other assemblies. What would you draw out of thinking that, you know, this was quite, this was quite special about the Danish one or, or, or where it might learn from another another jurisdiction. What, what are your thoughts, Ingrid? Yeah, but I think, you know, we talked about this, that it's so difficult actually to find out what the climate citizens assembly method is because it's so different from country to country. So I think in the Danish case, we know that there was a, that the ministry looked towards Ireland first and then towards uh, and also followed the French assembly but that there was some, at least to my knowledge, some kind of cooperation between the Scottish and the Danish assembly because they were kind of like coming together at the same time. Um, I think, so I think what is, is special about the Danish case is this, um, is that a, is the way that it was commissioned. And there are some similarities here to the French case, but then the different uh, of finances and how it was funded really also makes a difference with how it unfolded. And it also, I, I guess, you know, comparing to the French case, the French case was very public and, you know, became an object of public deliberation. My understanding is, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong, is that this most Danes don't know that the, the, the assembly happened. It's been quite, it, it not, 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 not because you, people have wanted to keep it private, but it hasn't had the same level of publicity. No, but I think that's like quite correct, actually. And I think it's unfortunately that it's, it is this way because uh, I think if more people knew that the Climate Citizens Assembly was there and that they actually made this recommendation, it would, it would mean quite a lot and it could have a great influence, I think. But if, now, last mentioned the climate partnerships. So I did a really <laughs> not so thorough uh, search on how much the media wrote about the climate partnerships in comparison to the Climate Citizens Assembly. And it was actually quite stacking. So like they wrote that almost, fit, I think it was 13 more articles about like, like about like 13 um, <laughs> a, more articles about the, um, the partnerships and the Climate Citizens Assembly. So it was really not a public process at all, actually. The, the climate partnerships, I'm guessing, had a much more smooth, have probably got a paid media and kind of marketing kind of angle, which may, maybe maybe, yeah. is, maybe is missing here. Yeah, and it seemed that this part of the process was somewhat up to the citizens for themselves to figure out. And I think that's that's really difficult to do yeah. when you're already volunteering so much time. To the assembly. Yeah, we're actually hearing more and more actually from a lot of assemblies where they're saying that kind of media strategy is a kind of secondary consideration actually, and that maybe that's something we need to we need to be spending more time on. So um, I've mentioned um, Lars introduced and Britta talked about it as well. The this two stage process. Of course, you only saw the end of the first stage and the and the um, and the whole of the second stage. But you've been talking to the citizens. What 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 do you think we can learn from these? different approaches, the kind of more top down and the more bottom up. Do, do you have any thoughts on that, Ingrid? Well, I have a lot of thoughts, but <laughs> it's just about kind of figuring it out. So as an observer from the outside, what I think was really interesting about the third, uh, the first phase compared to the second phase. And I mean, so in our research group, we had people following the first phase. And we think there was something about the level of conflict between the first and the second phase. And then I think we were kind of startled in the first phase about like, where is the conflict? Like, how are they just agreeing on everything? And then like, maybe we've just been in the breakout rooms where they were agreeing, maybe we didn't see something, but it was just 
that was really startling for us. Like, shouldn't there be some conflicts? These are really complicated political areas. And in the second phase, we really got, I think, conflict. And um, I, I don't know, I imagine that it had, must have been difficult sometimes for the citizens to be in because I, I really recognize was what Britta is saying is that I think that there were maybe some people who came with agendas that because they kind of knew from the first phase how to kind of wiggle in the system or like figure out how to get around the facilitators or, but, I, but my sense is that, that it was more conflictual and there was more discussions. I'm not sure whether it's a bad thing. I have to say then. No, 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 I'm not because that that that's interesting. They're, they're a different dynamic at work. You've you've felt yeah, okay, okay, definitely. Um, and I, do you have any sense of at all? If, if I don't know if you've been interviewing um people in the it, within the administration about the kind of impact that this has had on 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 politicians and on civil servants. Yeah, so I only I've only interviewed uh, civil servants and. What they're telling is that, well, it has the, the, these recommendations have some kind of life in the bureaucracy and they, they really don't understand why. Like, so for them, it's really difficult to understand uh, the urge of, like, uh, of uh, having to be told for how it's influenced because they think that it's, well, these processes take time and of course we don't just implement something. It has to go through so many organizations and like uh, different people before it can become policy. So I think there's also something about these two logics that is kind of like, it, they don't make sense because the citizens were so fast in making these, um, these uh, recommendations and the, the system, it takes longer time, I think. And do you think, do you, uh, is there a, are, are civil servants, how do they regard the assembly? Do they regard it as something as a positive contribution, or are they skeptical about it? Because one of the one of the things that we're doing some work in with in is that is 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 thinking about how you prepare an assembly, how you prepare an administration for an, an assembly, and it kind of somehow sometimes administrators are quite surprised when these things appear, you know, and they don't necessarily know anything about them until they get a recommendation <laughs> all on their desk. So I'm I'm wondering. How did they how how did they feel about the assembly? What kind of orientation do they have towards it? Yeah, so but I think that the the interesting so in the Danish case the the civil uh, the civil servants were like also the organizers because it came from government. So of course here it's a little bit we had the people we interviewed were people who have been working with the assembly since it was established. Right. So in that sense, there is more of a like they know where why it's why it's there and. At least for my interviews, it seemed that they were very enthusiastic about the project, and that's that's the sense I've been getting all along. I I kind of tried to actually ask about like, so how is everyone else in the Ministry of the <laughs> Climate are they excited about this? And we did I didn't get any like really good answers on those uh, questions. But <laughs> I'm always wondering about the person who works in the transport department who suddenly gets this. A recommendation on transport yeah. from an assembly they've never heard of and you know it's yeah sort of like, it's sort of like a, and i, I think, think that must be a strange process <laughs> yeah is there anything else that you want to before before we end this is there anything else you, you you think we should know about the danish process that that i haven't asked you is there anything anything that that uh, that uh, you feel you feel we've missed mm, i don't think so right now no okay that's great that that makes me feel better because that means yeah. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, at this point, I'd like to bring Lars and Britta back in, but I'm also going to bring in um, bring in Frederick, who's from um, DBT, who's also who's on the management group of uh, Kanoka. I don't know if Frederick's there. Um, Frederick, you've been following the chat. Um, I don't know whether you want to summarise things or you want to invite people into the space, but I thought what we would do is maybe take two or three questions and, and then give the panel a chance to respond and then may, maybe take a couple more so I don't know the power is the power is yours my friend um so hello everybody and indeed I guess the power in my hands um so I think I'm just gonna pick a few questions uh, I can see first uh, when you talked to last there was some uh, questions uh, for example regret uh, regarding the concreteness of the process so 
um, if you can elaborate some on, on that last, for example, there's a question on whether has there been any monitoring on the carbon budget? So could, is anybody, had anybody taking a look at the recommendations and said, okay, this would uh, reduce the carbon this and that much? And how does it relate to the national targets and so on and so forth? Um, there's also a question regarding whether, so the participants had a lot of control, but did they also, could they also say something about the, re, the link to the policy cycle um, and have any kind of, of um, um, say on that? And then for Britta, there was a couple of questions too. Um, for example, um, were you what what is your feeling that the assembly is just consultative would you have liked it to be otherwise um having binding um influence or something like that um and also your whether you have some reflections on the you said that you heard from experts and that you your, some of your recommendations aligned with those inputs? Were there also recommendations that didn't? And uh, can you elaborate on why you chose not to follow the, the or may put forward recommendations that aligned with the expert inputs? Okay, that's, that's, were... that's great, Frederick, thanks. I'm actually gonna um, jump in with another question that I've just seen there, because I think it's crucial, which is about how the members were selected. Because Lars used the term self-selection, but it, there were, it, we must, that it, it was done through a sortition process. Um, Britta, actually, maybe you could talk through how you how you got involved. How did you how did you get into the assembly? Um, I simply got an an invite in my uh, e box, <laughs> uh, so I I I I was simply simply randomly uh, statistically randomly selected by chance. <laughs> So it was uh, my pure luck. Um, I did not. Uh, I did not uh, apply or anything. I think that's really important, and I think it was just the statistical authority that. that yes, that it was a statistical done. authority, and we also got uh, uh, a presentation on on how and and how they had had uh, conducted that. So. Yeah. So, so I think pure, I think, pure I think, statistics. Yeah, I think when Lars mentions self-selection, I, th I think he means of those people who are invited rather than actually anybody who, anybody who turns up. So, so, so Lars, someone was asking about the uh, about uh, particular concrete examples, although Britta could say something about that, but also about how you ensured that recommendations actually had the, you know, were, were having the kind of impact on the sort of expectations of the of, of, of the Danish, the commitments of the Danish government. I think one of the question was about uh, did we monitor the effect of the of the recommendations that the citizens came with? We didn't, but it was something we actually suggested in the beginning that I should be. Uh, in my view, the perfect uh, citizen assembly has uh, a modeler uh, calculations in parallel, so that the citizens can ask if we if we suggest this and this, how much impact will it have on on the climate uh, uh, emissions? Or, or what will it cost or something like that? Because I mean, uh, most European countries now have well-functioning uh, energy models that can answer these kind of questions, at least, I mean, give an estimate, which is uh, a fair estimate. And and you, I, and that, and, but they didn't get this kind of support. And I actually think it would have been fun to have the have a have a, a, a back and forth uh, discussion between the modelers and and the citizens. But not only fun, it would be effective. So the citizens get some idea of the proportions of effect of what they they suggest. But we didn't do that. I would really like to do that uh, another time. Uh, could the citizens say something about the link to policy? Yes, they were free to say something about anything they wanted to say something about. And they did. Uh, so, so we had a totally open agenda. One thing is we had themes, but anything that was decided along the way that the citizens wanted to write about, they just could just write about it. So there were no, there was no, no limits. And they actually did write about the link to policy. But so they they you they sort of talked about the policy, but I think that one of the points that was being made was raising this question. They couldn't, for example, as they could in France, suggest that something should go to a referendum, or they could or they could do that. 
they they could suggest it. Uh, another thing is it would happen, but they could suggest <laughs> anything. Uh, for example, there were recommendations about uh, installing a Danish climate day. There were recommendations about making the uh, citizen assembly permanent. There were recommendations about uh, that a citizen assembly should not be on the cost of listening to experts because, because uh, Danish uh, policy should be much more uh, knowledge based. Uh, uh, that's at least how I read that recommendations. There are several recommendations about how policy in itself could manage this better. Okay, that's really helpful. Britta, do, what, what do you, how do you answer the question of, do, would you rather have seen this process of being more than just consultative? I'm not, I'm not sure that that necessarily means that you should have, fine, maybe it does mean for some people you should have final decision-making power, but or, or it might mean that that the government has a, a stronger requirement to respond. How, how do you feel about that, Britta? Or are you, were you happy with, with, with the sort of uh, level of influence you had? Um, I sorry, I just need to get my cat on there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's the Zoom cat. There's always a Zoom it's cat. A Zoom, yeah. Um, uh, per personally, I'm I'm happy to to have to have had this consultative uh, uh, role, um, but we have also been discussing uh, in the assembly to commit the politician uh, even further, uh, at least to to respond uh, how they had handled uh, the recommendation and how they had made use of that, and that's also what Lars uh, laid out. Uh, um, one of the participant. Uh, uh, ask that question um are, are you actively as a I just have because some could because it, this has happened in one or two assemblies are you actively in contact with other members of the assembly and and sort of but you know as, if you like informally monitoring and scrutinizing or have you have you have you left that now um I'm not sure what you're asking me. I, I, I don't have I don't have informal contacts with any of the participants outside the arranged uh, uh, meetings. Uh, I haven't had that. Um, so, so in a couple of assemblies, the assembly members have created kind of groups, which then yes, which yes. then which then follow up, you know, to see what government is doing. And I just, yeah. that, that that hasn't happened here. No, that hasn't happened. Okay. So the other the other question the other question was you mentioned that many of your um, you mentioned that many of your proposals followed the followed recommendations that were or, or the position of particular experts and someone asked were there any recommendations where you push back on the experts and said actually you know and went a different way is there anything that comes to mind where um it, it's or, a super good maybe you had a, a different emphasis or something yeah it's a super relevant question um I, th I think in some of the groups there were uh, in the in the two group works uh, where I participated, we did not get um, serious uh, pushback uh, from the experts, uh, and and so that was very much our own words uh, that that state. Um, but I think some of the other groups, uh, uh, yeah, got some pushback from experts and and have uh, decided what to do. Uh, but I don't have specific examples. It's a super good question. I don't know, maybe Lars, if you could uh, yeah. elaborate a bit, because you may have some specific examples that did not involve uh, the particular well, work. That well, I, might, I, I think that a problem seldom looks like that, that the citizens is against uh, expert advice is more that the experts do not agree. And then the citizens take a position in this discussion, which is, I mean, uh, part of the function of citizen engagement, in my view, in, in, in technology yeah. and science issues. Because per definitions, experts do not agree. Uh, I suppose, I suppose yeah. the other thing you get, Lars, is a kind of um, perhaps is a sort of a, sit a perspective from the citizens on this issue, which is a different, you know, in the in the sense of seeing it from a citizen's perspective. You know, you 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 see you see different potential policy solutions that come out. Certainly, with other assemblies, we've seen um, recommendations where the citizens. An example from the UK, where the where the citizens were very clear that if there was they if there was a government program of insulation of houses, they wanted it to be led by a lo local local organisations because they didn't trust government. Do you know what I mean? There was a so so there are kind of there are ways that citizens frame may may have framed um, recommendations that aren't the same which may differ from the way that experts think about it. Is that is the, did you get any of that at all? 
I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure we did get a lot of, I, I know that from other, uh, being 30 years in citizen engagement, I have seen that happen many times, but I'm not, I'm, uh, there's not one example from this, from this citizen assembly where it really, really pops up. Okay. I'd, I'd rather say that what I what I think happened a lot this time was that and 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 which I also think is a very high quali good quality about uh, citizen engagement is that when we see these experts not really agree, then the citizens find a doable path in 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 that in that sit situation of contesting uh, different expressions. So. So when things are contested from different sides, uh, different positions, then they say, okay, how can we manage that? And then they come up with a suggestion that would work. And a good example is the, uh, the, the um, carbon tax, where for example, there's an expert committee just presenting three different models. Uh, the citizens uh, assembly, uh, and, and these models do not really, I mean, they have really, really tough choices in them, each of them. Yeah. But the citizens assembly has said, we start with the, with the model uh, three, where we uh, give some, uh, some reduction of tax to the, uh, to the uh, uh, fossil intensive uh, industry, and then they have to become better. And then we, then we increase the, uh, uh, the tax over time, and then we reduce the uh, the reduction of tax that these industries get. So basically, they said we should have a, a path from model three to two to one, and one is we have an equal tax over. And and, and that committee didn't do that. The citizens did that. Okay. Well, and that's, and, and that's, that's very cool. just very practical view on how we we sit there. People say different things. How can we actually make concrete and workable policies out of that? Okay. Ingrid, that happens a lot, and it also happened a lot in, in, in these two uh, rounds. Ingrid, you, you, you saw the citizens kind of wrestling with expert knowledge. Do you have anything to add to, add to this at all? Was there, was there anything that was striking for you? No, I'm, I must say mostly I was really impressed by the way they handled the expert knowledge. I think, uh, I think for me sometimes, I, so I saw um, in the second phase, all of the expert meetings, and I thought it was a lot of knowledge to get within. Like this was evenings after work, but so I'm mostly just actually impressed of the way that they uh, took everything in and really handled it very seriously. So okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good that's a good endorsement of what of what, of what happened. Um, Fred Frederick, is there, if, if there are any other questions that we we should deal with before we? Uh, before we end the meeting. Um, yeah, so I don't see any immediate questions arising um, from these uh, last answers and okay. stuff that hadn't, hasn't been touched upon. So... Um, okay, nothing, not, but if we've got a happy audience, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy at that. Okay, so um, we just had a, I, I'd just like to give you a, a, a minute or two each, if there's anything that you'd like to um, say, which we haven't picked up on, um, and you feel ought to have been said or anything you want to reinforce. So, so Lars, is there anything that, that you feel we haven't picked up on in this call that you would like people to be aware of about the assembly? Um... The answer can be I no. think, yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm just, you know, just thinking of how to phrase this. Uh, <laughs> I, I, as a facilitator, I actually think it's it's difficult to work with the concept of a citizen assembly because it is such a diverse concept, uh, and uh, and and uh, in a way, I think uh, uh, there there are there are pros and cons of that. If 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 we, for example, think in the future that this process should be permanent. Then I think it will it will freeze if it's too 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 uh, narrowly defined. I mean, because then it then it a narrowly defined methodology will also have it a narrow uh, use uh, space. So in a way, as a if this is going to, if if the thinking is that this should be permanent, then I think we should begin to talk of this as a methodological frame, rather than a method rather than a method. And I, I certainly separate between the two, 
Uh, a method is a very concrete recipe of what to do. Then, then you do that. Then you do that. Then you do that. That's not the situation here. Here you have to say, okay, which situation are we in? What are we going to do here? And then you begin to pick. It's more like a, a, a workshop is not a method. It's a frame. You you pick different ways of working and put it into a workshop. And then you have a fu hopefully a well functioning workshop. It's not that much in <laughs> much of an open open concept in, in in citizen assembly, but it is quite open actually. No, so I think no. having yeah. having a professional discussion of how open should it be, which kind of, of, of tools is it we use, when is it we use them, I think would be very valuable. Uh, and 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 uh, at least that's a process we have in the Danish border technology that we begin to discuss discuss like this. I think I think that's really important, Lars, actually, because one of the things I've recognized is that each of these assemblies has been very different from the other ones. And yet, and there are also many different techniques and practices which we haven't used yet at, in climate assemblies. So there's a very real danger about kind of getting locked into one way of doing things. I, I agree I agree on that. Ingrid, is there anything that you that you feel that we should know? Is that a no? You feel that we've covered everything or we... <laughs> okay. But Britta, is there anything, any any final remarks you'd like to make about your experience in the assembly or or um or or this kind of this kind of attempt to do participatory politics? Uh, yes, I think I have two points. Maybe the first one aligns a bit or follow is the follow up on what uh, what last year said. Um, I think it's super important that the purpose uh, is clear. Uh, we were struggling a little bit in the first round with what was the purpose uh, of this work that we were. Uh, that we had to take on our shoulders. Um, so a very clear purpose up front uh, and, and also what to use the, the outcome uh, of the work to. Um, that's a clear recommendation to be very sharp uh, on that. Um, uh, simply because you ask people to put in quite a significant amount of their time <laughs> into the, think, into the process. That's... Uh, and, and then I think I would just repeat what, what I said already, but uh, that, that uh, also because when you give uh, the citizens uh, responsibilities, they are, we were able to, uh, to take that responsibility. Uh, I think that was a very important learning um, from, from my side. Uh, yeah, I think, that's a, I think that is really critical. And I think that's something we've learned across all of the assemblies is the willingness. Yes. I mean, we, we, may, we may differ in thinking about exactly how these institutions should be integrated or, or what methodology we should use. But what, what's been clear from the is, is the evidence that citizens are willing and able to do this work. Yes, definitely citizens are willing and able. Uh, yeah, I brilliant. think that's a clear takeaway. Uh, okay, let, oh, Lars. Thank you. Then I, I will follow up on what Peter said. Um, because um, uh, the outcome discussion, uh, there has been so much discussion about mandate or, I mean, which mandate should these kind of processes have and which roles should it play and so on. Um, I think uh, to me, it's, it crystallizes more and more that it's really not the mandate, it's the planning of the follow-up process that matters. Yeah. I mean, uh, do you do you uh, do you already from the start say we are going to do this and this and this, and the decisions on press and and uh, and media work and the these and these are there and there, and they have to do this and this and this. And do you already from the start uh, impose such uh, follow-up uh, processes on the organization? Uh, because that can be difficult to do later on. Yeah. And, and uh, so so I and. And just promises and promises without these follow-up activities doesn't make sense at all. Mandates, nothing worth if they are not followed up on. And and I, think, I, I, I think we I, have several examples of that. Yeah, and I think one of the things in, in Kanoka that we're really keen on is that when people think about designing and implementing climate assemblies, it isn't just about the bit where you engage the citizens. It's actually about preparing beforehand and preparing preparing beforehand about what you're going to do after and, and during. And I think we spent too, we spend too much time thinking about the the citizen bit and not enough about the kind of broader public broader 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 administration. So I, I think that's that's well taken, Lars. So um, I'd like to thank um, Lars. I'd like to thank Ingrid, and I'd like to thank Britta for for giving us their insights uh, this this afternoon. It's been I've, I've personally learned a lot and I, I hope you have too and thank you for the participants for your questions.